This video shows how to apply a principal component analysis in Python. This is the third video of a series on PCA and in the first video we have explained how to use a PCA theoretically. In the second video we have explained how to apply a principal component analysis in the R programming language. And now in this video we will explain how to apply a PCA in Python. The video is presented by Chansu Kebabchi, who is a data scientist and statistician at Statistics Globe. So, without too much talk, I'll head it over to Chansu. Hello! Hello everyone! Today I'll show you how to perform principal component analysis in the Python programming language. Without further ado, let's code it. First, we will ensure that we have the all necessary libraries in our Python environment. In this tutorial, we will use four main libraries, scikit-learn, pandas, matplotlib, and numpy. If these are not installed yet, please first run this pip install comments in your environment. Once the libraries are installed, we import them along with the relevant modules. We will import numpy li library, pandas library, and load breast cancer function of the scikit-learn library um, from which we will retrieve our sample data and we will also import the PCA class from scikit-learn library to perform our analysis and also we need the standard scalar class to standardize our data um, before, before the analysis and finally we need to uh, import matplotlib to visualize our results. So let's run this. And the next step is to load our uh, sample data, which is breast cancer data. Uh, we will use the load breast cancer function um, to load it and we will save it as breast cancer. It is a dictionary-like object which have um, different data elements. You, so you can check the um, uh, elements contained in this data using the keys method. The data element consists of measurements for 569 samples of breast lesions. These measurements include um, the mean, standard deviation and maximum values of 10 lesion attributes. We can check the dimensions of this data using the shape attribute and you can see that each row represents a sample and each column represents a measurement. The uh, next data element is target element which stores the type of lesion which can be malignant or benign, in other words cancerous or non-cancerous. You can see that these groups are encoded by zeros and ones. Another important data element is future names, which stores the names of the measurements. As early uh, mentioned, uh, you can see that the mean measurements and um, standard deviation measurements and also the maximum value measurements, which are coded as worst um, measurement, are included. The next step is to convert this data into a data frame. In this tutorial, we are only interested in the mean measurements, which are stored in the first 10 columns of the um, measurement data. Therefore, we will extract the first 10 columns only, and relatedly, we will extract the first 10 elements of future names vector. Let's see the first few rows of uh, the subsetted data. Uh, here, as you can see, we only have the mean measurements and we ignore the rest. The next step is to standardize our data. It is a crucial step uh, before performing a PCA. If you wonder why, you should visit our tutorial um, PCA uh, using covariance metrics versus correlation metrics. To standardize our data, first uh, we need to create a standard scalar um, object, which I saved as scalar here. Then I should fit this to my data frame df to transform it to standardized uh, numbers. 
As you can see, it returns a NumPy array, therefore I should return it back to a pandas data frame. Just previously done, uh, in a similar way, I parse the data object that I want to convert and also the related feature names to name my columns. And now I have the same data, but this time with standardized values, so which means I'm ready to perform PCA. The first step is to decide the ideal number of components. In order to do that, I will run my PCA without reducing dimensionality, which means uh, creating 10 components for 10 original variables and then fitting it, then extracting the um, variance information per component to decide the ideal component number. So as early said, I'm, I'm creating a PCA object for uh, 10 components, then I should fit it to my scaled data, DF scaled. Then I will print the result and also print the dimensions. Here you see the resulted um, array with 10 columns and 569 rows as each column represents a principal component. And next I can retrieve the explain variance ratio using the explain variance ratio attribute of the PCA object and then I can save it in a variable. Um, here it is called propvar. And to visualize this result, one of the most common ways is to create a script plot. To create my x-axis data, I should also create an array of component numbers. In order to do that, I will retrieve the end components attribute, which um, stores the total number of components created. Then I will use a range function to create an array with evenly spaced numbers. And here there is also a plus to start this array from one instead of zero. So this is the data that I will use on the x-axis. Now I can plot my scree plot. In the plot function, I parse PCA number, PC number and prop var data. And also I add plot annotations and also the grid lines to enhance the interpretability of the graph. And also, um, I forgot to tell that uh, here the line type is also given, which is red solid line with uh, circle markers. So this is my result. Here you can see how the proportion of variance change uh, with respect to the a component number in use. There are different techniques to decide the ideal number based on this graph. One common technique is using the elbow method. Based on this method, the user should select the component just before the lines flatten out. And accordingly, um, it seems like the three components uh, seems sufficient to use. But alternatively, you can also use Kaiser's method, which suggests keeping components explaining data variation greater than one. In order to do that, we should replace the explain variance ratio with absolute explain variance, which is stored in explain variance attribute of PCA object. I saved it here as var. Let's run in this. And now we will parse this information into our plot function, but additionally here I also use AXH line function intersecting the y-axis at 1 to show the threshold and I color this line uh, red and I prefer the line style dash line. Let's see how my graph changed. So this is our new script plot using variance uh, data and with a um, threshold drawn. Based on this graph, two components uh, are ideal to keep. Uh, considering both results, I will stick with the two components, which is easier to interpret and also visualize. So the next step is to perform uh, the principal component analysis um, for two components, 
which will reduce the dimensionality to two dimensions. Similarly, I um, set the end components argument to two and transform my div scale data using this created PCA object. And next I will print it and also print the um, dimensions of the output. So this is the output. As you can see, it has 569 rows again for uh, each sample and two columns as each represents one created component. So now our data is transformed to its new dimensional space. The next step is to interpret the results uh, using um, biplots. If you are interested in what biplot is and how to interpret it, uh, I suggest you to visit our tutorial Biplot Explain for PCA because I'm not getting into details here. So the first step to plot this biplot is to extract the components. Uh, so as you can see, I subset the first and the second column of the PC array and saving them as PC1 and PC2. Then I will extract the loadings, which explains the association between the components and the original variables by calling the components attribute of PCA object. And let's print them and also check the dimensions. So here you can see there are two rows representing each component and 10 columns representing each 10 original variable and the matching cells uh, showing the associations. Following this, I need to create a scaling factor for component values since the range of these values are quite different than loadings range, which is a problem to represent both, um, both two types of data in the same graph. I use here min-max scaling and you'll see what I'll use per component uh, as a scaling factor. Finally, I need to extract the feature names, which stores the variable names, and I will use this data in labeling my loading vectors. So everything is done uh, regarding biplot data. So the next step is to use this information, drawing my biplot. So first we will iterate through the futures and for each future I plot an arrow using the arrow function and these arrows will start from the origin and will end at the coordinates of loadings. And I will also use the text function to label these arrows by the future name. So the coordinates are again specified by the loadings uh, themselves, but I also use here an arbitrary scaling factor to put a space between the arrow and the arrow label. So this is all about the loading vectors. Next I will draw my data points. In order to do that I will use a scatter function and I will parse the uh, principal components and as early said I'm using a scaling here to represent the data points well with the loading vectors on my graph. So let's run this. This script gives a biplot with blue uh, data points and black loading vectors, each labeled by the future name. However, if you want to emphasize a specific graph component, you can still customize uh, your biplot. Um, for instance, if you're interested in um, emphasizing the loading vectors, you can uh, change the uh, size and also the color of these vectors. Let's see how I done it here. Uh, here I set head width and head length arguments to increase the size of the arrow heads and also I increase the line width as well. In addition to that I also uh, specified uh, the arrow color as red to use a brighter color 
And relatedly, I also use the red color for the text labeling those arrows. Let's see. Here you can see the arrows are much more visible and eye-catching. Alternatively, you can also customize how your data points uh, look. For instance, you can label them. In order to do that, I set a um, second for loop, which iterates through the indexes of the data frame. And by using the text function, each data point are labeled by the given label, which is converted to a string using the str function. Um, the font size, you can also set the font size as you wish. Um, the rest of the code is the same. Um, with the previous one. However, there is one change here, um, which is the size of the data point. I reduced it a bit to avoid overlapping between the data point labels and the data point themselves. So let's see the result. As you can see, now all data points are labeled, so you can see where uh, a specific data point locates uh, with respect to the principal components and you can make a specific interpretation um, of that particular data point. Um, the next alternative is to color your data points. One common thing is to color them based on a group variable if uh, there is one. Remember that uh, in our case um, there is a target attribute which stores the type of the breast lesions. Therefore, we can use it to color our data points based on the type of the lesion. Uh, first, I create a variable called groups to store that information. And then I um, input this information in the scatter function. I set the color argument to groups and the color map argument to vary this uh, color palette. And additionally, I save this uh, data in Scatter to use this information in my legend using the legend elements method. So let's run this. As you can see, my biplot now shows the uh, groups as well, and the legend also labels those groups uh, as 0 and 1, since they are encoded in the target uh, array uh, like that. But if you're interested in using uh, more informative labels, uh, like malignant and benign in this case, you should work uh, around a bit, which means um, drawing a scatter plot separately for each data group. The first thing to do is to create a data frame which contains the components and also the target attribute. Let's see the result. So as you can see, uh, there are component values in the first two columns and also the group variable that I created based on the target attribute. And then uh, we should subset uh, each group uh, component pair as follows, which will create four data sets. And then, like done before, I have to uh, create a scaling factor for each set. I again here use the min-max scaling and now finally, I can um, use this data in drawing my new biplot. As seen, I use the first scatter function to input the malignant data and the chosen color for it and the label. And for the second scatter function, I um, give the benign uh, group data information and also the, the color that I selected and the label benign. Since here the colors and the labels are directly associated, I don't need any additional method uh, creating my legend because the information will be directly extracted from the scatter function. So let's run this. 
Here you can see my legend is much more informative now. By plotting this by plot, we end our tutorial here. Please don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel.